If you have your Bibles, turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 28. Starting with verse 5, the word of God says, When Saul saw the Philistine army, he was afraid. Terror filled his heart. He inquired of the Lord, but the Lord did not answer him by dreams or Urim or prophets. Saul then said to his attendants, find me a woman who is a medium, so I may go and inquire of her. Some versions will say which. There is one in Endor, they said. So Saul disguised himself, putting on other clothes, and at night he and two men went to the woman. Consult a spirit for me, he said, and bring up for me the one I name. Let us pray. Father, thank you so much that you have given us an opportunity to delve into your word. And this, this particular message has some dark places in it. But Father, we also have some dark places in our heart that must be addressed. And we definitely want to address that as we approach this uh, most sacred uh, service of communion. So Father, thank you for making this a reality. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Let everyone say Amen and amen. Consult a spirit for me, he said, and bring up for me the one I name. I, I want to preach from the title, Which Word? Which Word? It's interesting that in this text we're told a couple of things that I just want to address before we go on to the, the more deeper parts of this uh, message. And that is that um, God stopped talking to Saul. Remember, up to this point, there was still meaningful conversation. Even though Saul seemed to be haunted by evil spirits, we are told that he was still prophesying, meaning the Holy Spirit was still working on him, and he was, he was working on God's team as he would prophesy as the Spirit came upon him. That was his spiritual gift, as Paul talks about the many spiritual gifts in the church, and one is prophecy. That was Saul's spiritual gift. I know that may not sit well with everyone, but that's in the scripture. But God had stopped speaking to Saul, and this was really important because Saul wanted to hear from God before he went into battle with the Philistines because he was terrified, and he wanted to know, should this be something I take part in? Should I lead my men into battle? Will we be, be victorious? And Saul, including David and a number of faithful people, would not go into battle if God did not give them clarity, if God did not give them vision, if God did not give them the A-OK. -okay. But he was not hearing from God. Can I just say something real quick? If you find yourself terrified like Saul before you go into a battle and you're not hearing from God, I'm just going to just throw this out there as a suggestion. That battle is not for you. That battle is not for you. Some of us go into battles that are not where we are supposed to be fighting. We take on things we should not take on. We take on, we, we get into disagreements and, and, and we find ourselves in these situations. And our church has suffered from it as well. Different factions that are fighting against one another and people's feelings are hurt. And I'm telling you, some battles we're not supposed to be in because God did not direct us to be in those kind of battles. Can I tell you that the kind of battles the church should always be in? when we want to tackle on homelessness in the, in the community. We, we want to make sure that we are sharing the gospel message with people who have no hope. These are the kind of battles that we should be engaging in, but not the kind of battles that we find ourselves in the church, fighting for our particular opinion, fighting for our particular interest, and so on and so forth. Saul is ready to fight, but he does not have an unction from the Holy Spirit telling him to go forward. So he's, he's confused. But, but, but can I just say this as well, along with don't fight battles that God doesn't tell you to fight? If you're not hearing from God, you have more things that are concerning in your life than the battle with the Philistines. The fact that God was not talking to Saul anymore should have been the only disagreement or, or conversation or, or battle that he should have been waging. Lord, talk to me now. He should have had a Jacob wrestling with God all night kind of situation, right? This is where he should have employed his interest and his energy, not in, should I fight the Philistines? If you're not hearing from God, you have bigger issues. 
You're worried about that job, that promotion, that relationship, and you're like, Lord, I need direction, but I'm not hearing from you. That is your bigger issue, not the next relationship, not the promotion. First, fix your relationship with God. Fix your connection with God. It is impossible for us to move forward in life and experience any level of true success and fruitfulness if we are not connected to Christ. Remain in me and I will remain in you. If you remain in me, you will bear much fruit, according to John 15. Apart from me, you can do nada. So this is, what he, this is what he decides to do. He cannot hear from God, and he's so desperate, he decides to seek out someone who he can connect with a prophet, some spiritual being. And the Bible says that he goes to a medium and this is really interesting because in Deuteronomy and Leviticus, we're, we're told by God not to mess with spiritists, not to mess with those who speak to the dead. No witches, no warlocks, and Saul had already chased all of them out of Israel, according to chapter 28. But he said, find me somebody who's bold enough to still stay in Israel. Find me someone who can consult the dead. And so this is what happens. We go to verse 11. Verse 11 says, Then the woman asked him, Who shall I bring up for you? Bring up Samuel, he said. When the woman saw Samuel, she cried out at the top of her voice and said to Saul, Why have you deceived me? You are Saul. The king said to her, Don't be afraid. What do you see? The woman said, I see a ghostly figure coming up out of the earth. What does he look like, he asked. An old man wearing a robe is coming up, she said. Then Saul knew it was Samuel, and he bowed down and prostrated himself with his face to the ground. Samuel said to him, said to Saul, why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? I am in great distress, Saul said. The Philistines are fighting against me, and God has departed from me. He no longer answers me, either by prophets or by dreams. So I have called on you to tell me what to do. So let's just pause there for a quick second here. He's already clear that God is no longer speaking to him through the appropriate channels, right? God is not speaking to me through prophets, the dreams, not the Urim. No one is able to, 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 to hear from God on my behalf. So he decides to consult the other team, just like David did last week with the Philistines, right? As if this formula works. I can't hear from God, so I'm going to listen to ungodly advice. Doesn't sound really smart, does it? So if God is not speaking to you through the appropriate channels that he has ordained, what makes you think he's going to speak to you through channels he has not ordained, that he has forbidden, that he has considered sinful? Doesn't make a lot of sense, right? But sin doesn't make us the smartest individuals, does it? So you already know that something's amiss here. And so continues on as he's asking for this advice and Samuel said, why do you consult me now that the Lord has departed from you and become your enemy? The Lord has done what he predicted through me. The Lord has torn the kingdom out of your hands and given it to one of your neighbors, to David, because you did not obey the Lord or carry out his fierce wrath against the Amalekites. The Lord has done this to you today. The Lord will deliver both Israel and you into the hands of the Philistines. And tomorrow you and your sons will be what? Where? With me. This should let you know there's something really wrong with this conversation. The Lord will also give the army of Israel into the hands of the Philistines. Immediately, the Bible says, Saul fell full length on the ground, filled with fear because of Samuel's words. His strength was gone, for he had eaten nothing all that day and all that night. Question I have for you, who is this Samuel figure? <laughs> but how do we know it from Scripture? I know that we, 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 we have uh, authors and spiritual leaders in, in our church that have shared their opinion on who this figure is, but how do we know from Scripture alone? If you were to talk to someone in the community, someone from maybe another faith, how would you be able to tell them that this is not Samuel? Because there are many people that say this is evidence that the dead do know something. The dead are able to communicate with us. How do we know if this is the real Samuel or not? Well, 
There's a couple of things that I want you to understand uh, to, to, give you, to give you the true identity of this character. One is, and this is really important, God has no confederacy, no, no confederacy with Satan. God has no confederacy with Satan, meaning they do not work together. Are you guys catching that? It's not like God and Satan have this kind of like, you know, uh, um, a, a deal between one another in the alleyway and they say, hey, look, I need you to do me a solid. Right? There, there is no confederacy between good and evil. And let me tell you why. If it was ordained by God, then that means what's happening here right now is not a sin. And this is critical. This is why I tell a lot of people when they talk even about the cross and they say this is all a part of God's will. God wanted his son crucified, wanted him tormented so he could save us from our sins. No, no, he wanted his son to give up his life. How he gave up his life was sinful. Meaning that Pilate and Judas and all the characters that played a part in the torture and crucifixion of Jesus was never a part of God's perfect will. Are you guys understanding that? In other words, the cross does not save us. It is Jesus giving up his life that saves us. Somebody needs to say amen on that. He says, nobody takes my life. I give it up freely and I'll take it back when I'm good and ready. This is important distinction because many of us will sanitize evil thinking it's all a part of God's will. I've had some people talk about, oh, I tell you, I was, I, was, I, was, I was strung out for most of my life. I wasn't there for my kids, and I went through this, and I went through that. But you know what? I counted all the blessing because now, 40 years later, I'm back in the church, and God knew what he was doing. I'm like, wait a second. Hold up. Your little 40 years of hot mess was not God's will. I don't think your children would sign off on, oh, Dad, we're so glad we didn't see you for the last 40 years. Isn't God good? No. That was your foolishness. That was your rebellion. That God made something good out of that mess just speaks to his miraculous working power. That's just what Romans says, that all things work for the good of those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. That just means that God can make something good out of our garbage. But do not sanitize the garbage. That's still your mess. And it still smells. And many of us will still experience the consequences of our poor decisions, even from decades ago. And this is part of the problem that we have because we think that just because God forgives us and restores us that we will not continue to, to, to be victims to our own consequences. I, I do hope, uh, Brother Audrey, that your, your, your pinky is able to lose weight and get back to its normal size, but, but you may have to live with that consequence of that, of that overweight pinky for a long time. You may not be able to move it. And those are terrible consequences, as he shared in his children's story uh, earlier today. So we have to realize that this is not a confederacy of good and evil. God is not working with Satan. Now, there have been times in Scripture where Satan's like, I'll be a lying spirit, and I'll go deceive the prophets. And God is like, look, if they ain't listening to me, do as you please. But that is not God saying, Satan, do me a solid. So this is how you know this cannot be Samuel. The other issue that we, that we have in this situation is that it's already been clear that God is no longer speaking to Saul. So if God is no longer speaking to Saul, why is he now going to change his mind? You called the wrong number. You didn't dial the right number, and God's going to answer? Now he's going to answer? Because you were so persistent? Absolutely not. Saul dialed the wrong number. It was not God who answered. Do I need to say that again? God did not answer the wrong number that was dialed. So this is really critical for us to understand who the identity of this person is. The other way that you know this cannot be the real Samuel is the details. Especially those who talk about when you die, you go straight to heaven. Uh, uh, Samuel doesn't say, why did you bring me down from heaven? He says, why did you bring me up? Why did you bring me up? Where, where, where is this spirit coming from? 
It's not coming from up here. <laughs> it's not coming from up there. The Spirit is coming from down there. And, 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 and all of Jewish understanding, they knew that Sheol was down here, not up there. Why did you bring me up? And then he says some detail like, hey, tomorrow you, you and your sons are all going to be with me. Well, if Samuel's on the good team, <laughs> and he says that Saul and all his, all his sons are going to be with I, where is this location? Where is this place? It's, it's, it's a lot of the details. And here is the most telling one. Here is the most telling one. And I want you to get this. The message of this individual to Saul is one that has no hope. It is designed to zap Saul of all hope. You're going to die. Your sons are going to die. Israel's going to die. There is no hope at all. Destruction everywhere. This is not a message of God. Everything that God shares with us always has hope. Even in his, in his moments of denouncing evil and saying that he'll overthrow a city, there is, it's always laced with hope. We look at the book of Jonah. They heard the message in 40 days they would be overturned, but the people had hope because they knew who God was. They said, oh, let's start repenting. Let's, let's stop eating. Let's wear sackcloth. Perhaps God will change his mind. And what does Scripture tell us? Did God change his mind? Oh, absolutely. Jeremiah 18 tells us this. God says, if I announce to a city that they will be overthrown, but they repent from their wickedness, I will not overthrow the city. And if I promise a nation that they will be blessed, but they begin to do evil in my sight, no matter what I said I would do for them that was good, they will no longer be blessed. Prophecy, watch this. This is another sermon for a, another day. Prophecy can be conditional. In fact, I would tell you that most time, prophecy is conditional. Not God's promises. No, 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 no. Not God's promises. I'm talking about prophecy. Prophecy has a purpose, and we believe that even as an Adventist church. It's in our fourth volume uh, in, uh, of our Adventist commentary, so don't think I'm making something up. We believe this as a denomination. There is conditionality in prophecy, and it's, and it's in Scripture. It's Jeremiah 18. It's also in Ezekiel 18. In Ezekiel 33, if I tell a, right, a righteous man, he will, be, he will live, but he begins to do wickedness in my sight, he will not live. And if I tell an evil man that he will die because of his sins, his consequences are death, but he repents from what he has been doing that is wicked, then I will give him life. There is a level of conditionality and prophecy, and this is important. It simply means this. Prophecy is telling us the trajectory of our lives. When God calls us out and says, listen, this is where you're heading, Nineveh. You are heading to ultimate destruction. What God is hoping, as the doctor shows you the x-rays and tells you now that there's a condition you have in your heart, what the doctor's hoping, what God is hoping, is that you change your ways. This is why prophecy is given. I want to give you a glimpse of what the future looks like if you continue down this path. What Saul should have done is repented right on the spot and said, I'm wrong. I'm wrong. I, I'm, I don't know why I'm consulting this witch. I don't know why I'm, I, I've gone to such desperate measures. I need to return back to God. Do you think that God would have less mercy for Saul than he did for Nineveh? Nineveh was called the city of blood. According to the book of Nahum, you had to walk to the, the liquor store walk over dead bodies just to get to where you needed to go. That's what the book of Nahum says. Nineveh was wicked on top of wicked, yet God forgave them. And Jonah says, I knew this is what you were going to do in chapter 4. I knew that you're always gracious, always merciful, always ready to forgive and not punish. Those are Jonah's words. How would Jonah know that? Because <laughs> he's done it before. He knows God's M.O., this is important for us to understand. Even in this moment, Saul has a choice, but listen to what happens. Saul hears this proclamation, and he takes this message of hopelessness and moves his army into battle. If I heard this and believed it, the last thing I would do is fight. I'm sorry. I'm, I, 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 sometimes I just don't, I don't enter into battles I know I'm not going to win. Nope, God didn't give me the A-OK. Okay, okay. And, I, and I've been told that this is doom and gloom. I'm not going in with it. 
But Saul is so stubborn and so prideful, and this is what makes him like our antagonist, what makes him like the enemy. He believes it won't happen. Now the Philistines in chapter 31, verses 1 through 6, 1 Samuel chapter 31 says, Now the Philistines fought against Israel, and Israel and the Israelites fled before them, and many fell dead on Mount Geboah. The Philistines were in hot pursuit of Saul and his sons, and they killed his sons, Jonathan, Abinadab, and Malkishua. The fighting grew fierce around Saul, and when the archers overtook him, they wounded him critically. Saul said to his armor bearer, draw your sword and run me through, or these uncircumcised fellows will come and run me through and abuse me. But his armor bearer was terrified and would not do it, so Saul took his own sword and fell on it. When the armor bearer saw that Saul was dead, he too fell on his sword and died with him. So Saul and his three sons and his armor bearer and all his men died together that same day. Question, did God do this as a punishment to Saul's disobedience? No. This was a decision that Saul made. Saul brought about his own disastrous end. Family, I just want to give you a glimpse of what the future will look like. Even at the end of time, it is not an arbitrary act on the part of God. This is according to Ellen White in Desire of Ages and also Steps to Christ. It is not an arbitrary act on the part of God that excludes the wicked from heaven. They are shut out by their own unfitness. It is a decision that they alone make. Jesus says, we already alluded to it in the illustration in John 15, if you remain in me, if you remain in me, and those who choose not to remain, he says in verse 6, those who choose not to remain are like a branch that withers away. God does not wither the wicked away. They wither away because of their own choice to no longer remain. God in the end is not punitive. God in the end is not like, you don't want to be my friend? Well, you're going to get it now. Even in this moment, God is not the one who gave Saul the message. He spoke to demons. He consulted demons. The scripture calls this woman a woman with a familiar spirit, which means she was demon-possessed. The enemy, our arch enemy, is the one that gave the message through someone he knew would zap Saul of all hope. If Samuel's telling him he's a, he's a goner, <sighs> nobody wants you, nobody likes you. You, you, you are nothing. You're dead to me. That's really, that's really the message that came across. God's saying to Saul, you're dead to me, and so are your sons. But this is the message of Satan. Satan wants us to believe that when we fail, when we make mistakes, that we're cut off, and there is no more hope for us. But as long as we have a risen Savior, we always have hope. In fact, if I were to guess what the impardonable sin is, it looks something like this. A person who just simply gives up on God. You can't be as good as you're advertised. You just can't be. There's no way. Saul brought about his own disastrous end. It had nothing to do with God, and we need to stop blaming God for our own consequences. It'll be the same at the end of time when the wicked say, when they pray for the rocks to crush them. Their own choice. God's not throwing rocks on them. Now watch what happens here. As evil as Saul appears to be, and especially the way that he, he comes to his end, you would think that when David hears the news, he'd be like, that's right. <laughs> that's right, that's what you get. <laughs> But there were several people all throughout Israel that mourned his death. In 1 Samuel chapter 31, verses 11 and 2, it says, When the people of Jabesh Gilead heard what the Philistines had done to Saul, and I won't read that scripture because it's a little graphic, and this is why some things in the Bible aren't for children. Some of it not even for adults. <laughs> but they did, some, they did some, some pretty cruel things to the bodies of, of, of Saul and his sons. And it says that when the people of Jabesh Gilead heard what the Philistines had done to Saul, all their valiant men marched through the night to Beth Shan. They took down the bodies of Saul and his sons from the wall of Beth Shan and went to Jabesh where they burned them. They gave them a proper burial because it was considered to be the worst disgrace for your bodies not to be buried properly. 
And the reason why these people did this is because early in Saul's reign, he had delivered these people from oppression. And they remembered his kindness. And they wanted to honor Saul. And you know what? David was all behind it as well. It's really interesting because even when we see the worst in people and believe that they deserve their ultimate circumstances and their consequences, I love it when people can still see the good even in those individuals. And know this, if humanity can see the good in people and recognize the good in the people, how much more our Heavenly Father. Watch, I'm going to go somewhere here, 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 1, we're into 2 Samuel. Listen to David's response, and starting with verse 17, listen to David's response. David took up this lament concerning Saul and his son Jonathan, and he ordered that the people of Judah be taught this lament of the bow. It's a song that David specifically wrote to honor Saul and Jonathan. Let's continue down. It says, Saul and Jonathan, in life they were loved and admired, and in death they were not parted. They were swifter than eagles. They were stronger than lions. Daughters of Israel, weep for Saul, who clothed you in scarlet and finery, who adorned your garments with ornaments of gold. This is the song that the psalmist writes. Verses 26 and 27, I grieve for you, Jonathan, my brother. You were very dear to me. Your love for me was wonderful, more wonderful than that of women. How the mighty have fallen, the weapons of war have perished. In fact, all throughout that song, he keeps repeating, oh, how the mighty have fallen. When we hear that, that phrase in our culture, that's where it comes from. Oh, how the mighty have fallen. David has a song of lament for his friend Jonathan, and watch this, his father Saul. David mourned the death of Saul. If David mourned the death of Saul, guess who also was weeping? That's right, the father, Jesus, the Holy Spirit. Because Saul was their child. They anointed him. They had great plans for Saul. What Saul ultimately chose was not a part of their plan. Because Jesus weeps. Even for the Judases. You remember that for the communion experience, Jesus washed Judas' feet. And even when he called Judas a devil from the beginning, we always think it's because he's so evil. No, he's like the devil in that his pride would not allow him to accept forgiveness. That was Lucifer's issue in heaven. It wasn't because he didn't believe he was wrong. He knew he was wrong. It was pride that would not allow him to accept the forgiveness and the restoration that God had offered him. He's like, no, 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 I don't know how to deal with that. That just seems too good to be true. I don't, how will I face the rest of the angels that I pretty much convinced to vote for me? This is going to, I can't take it. I can't take it. I just rather not be a part of this. When Jesus tells Judas at the table, he says, go and do as you planned, Judas should have stood up and said, no. No, Jesus, I'm not going to go. You know it's me. You know I'm the one that is set to betray you, and you washed my feet, and you ate with me. Absolutely not. Judas, in that moment, could have had a Nineveh moment. And Jesus would have said, yes, brother. And they would have embraced, and they would have cried together. But pastor, the, Jesus would never have gone to the cross. Yes, he would have. They didn't need Judas. It would have happened. And if it didn't happen by the cross, it would have happened through a stoning. It would have happened some way. But just know this. Man was not required in order for God to redeem us. He gave up his life, and he took it back when he was ready. The part that Judas played and the part that Pilate played and the part that we play in our own mess, in the church, out of the church, it's our choices. But Jesus loved Saul. And he loves Judas. Because Jesus could say, yeah, Judas, I remember when you cast that demon out of that teenager. Oh, that was so wonderful. You believed in my power. You had such great faith, and my spirit was working through you. Judas was given charge over the money because he was more trusted than any of the other disciples. 
Matthew, the tax collector, wasn't even trusted with the money. And Matthew wrote a gospel. Judas was trusted. Was God's trust misplaced? Just because we fail doesn't mean that God failed in who he should trust in. Relationship is so important to God, he's willing to be vulnerable enough for us to betray his trust and break his trust. And this is the important part that we need to understand. God loves us so much, he's willing for it to even appear like he made the wrong choice. But he loves us so much, he's still going to create Lucifer. He loves us so much, he's still going to create an Adam and Eve. He loves us so much, he's still going to, he's still going to hire uh, Judas to be a part of his staff. He loves us so much, he's still going to appoint us all, knowing good and well that we may choose evil, and we do the same thing today. We still marry people that we know can leave us. They can say one thing one day and another thing the next, and we still have children that one day may abandon us. Nathan, don't leave. But one day Nathan could look me in the eye and say, I don't want to have anything to do with you. But that's the risk we take. But it's worth the risk. And you're worth the risk. Now let's close out. Let's close out before we go into this table. Because I want you to know how powerful this story is. David's song for Saul and Jonathan extended to his actions. Once David became king, after many years on the throne, he was still thinking of Jonathan and still thinking of Saul. You want to know how? 2 Samuel chapter 9, verse 1, David asked, Is there anyone left of the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness? Isn't that beautiful? Is there anyone left, anyone left from the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? 2 Samuel Chapter 9, verse 3 says, the king asked, is there no one still alive from the house of Saul to whom I can show God's kindness? Isn't this beautiful? Ziba answered the king, there is still a son of Jonathan. He is lame in both feet. Can I give you a little bit of history? Even though David had made a covenant with Saul that he would not destroy his family, the family didn't like that David was appointed king after Saul's death. And so there ensued a battle. Of course, David and his, his, his soldiers overcame. But in the, in the attempt to flee from David's soldiers, a little baby boy by the name of Mephibosheth was dropped by the lady who was taking care of him. And he was dropped as a baby, and his legs were injured, and he was crippled for the rest of his life. For the rest of his life, this little boy was made fun of. For the rest of his life, they knew who he was. Oh, I know who you are. I know who your granddaddy is. That evil man, Saul, the one who tried to take out our rightful, true king, David. Oh, I know your secret. And poor Mephibosheth, he was... He, he visibly wore the consequences of his family's rebellion. He felt cursed by God. The stories were all out there about how Saul had consulted a witch from Endor. Saul had chosen to believe the word from a demon. Whatever the demon said about his life and prophesied, he just took it wholeheartedly and it led to his doom. And now here is Mephibosheth, injured, crippled, Dependent, a part of a family that is, that is synonymous with rebellion. And yet David says, is there someone in Saul's family that I can show kindness to for Jonathan's sake? Mephibosheth is found and he's brought before him. When Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David, he bowed down to pay him honor. David said, Mephibosheth, he says, at your service. Don't be afraid, David said to him. This is, this is verse 6 through 8. Don't be afraid, he says. I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. I will restore to you all the land that belonged to your grandfather, Saul, and you will always eat at my table, Mephibosheth. You will always eat at my table, always. Every single meal, even your midnight snacks, will be at my table. Mephibosheth bowed down and said, What? is your servant that you should notice a dead dog like me. Family, who told him he was a dead dog? What words 
was he listening to? What word was he trusting? I'm nothing. I'm just a dead dog. I'm worthless. Look at me. You know my history. Which words do you listen to? Which words? Pastor, you don't understand. Last year I was involved in something in the church and I sent some angry text messages and some emails and I'm kind of afraid to show up and I don't even know how to make amends for what I said. I just, I thought I was right. I was convicted that I was right. And I, which words are you listening to? Are we not the redeemed? Forgiveness is our MO. Reconciliation is in our DNA. We're followers of Christ. He was the one as he was being nailed to a cross. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And the same God who said forgive them for they know not what they do is the same God who I believe, I believe this, I know you might have an issue with this, who I believe also paid for the price of Judas' sins. And he paid the price for Saul's sins. If Judas is not in the kingdom and Saul is not in the kingdom, it will not be because their way was not paid for. It will only be because they chose not to be, but not because of their final act. Father, but pastor, he didn't, he, didn't, he didn't ask for forgiveness before he died. How do you know? And are we really judged by our last breath? Who told you that? It's not in my Bible. God doesn't look at the composite of our life and said they did more good than bad. Or before they breathed their last, they told me to forgive their sins, so now they're, they're holy. We're not saved because of something we did or we do or will do. We're saved because of something that God did and continues to do as he intercedes on our behalf. You get to eat at my table. You are not a dead dog. And, and David proved it, 2 Samuel 9, 13. And Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem because he always ate at the king's table and he was lame in both feet this table is for you this table is for you you get to eat here all the days of your life you get to eat here but pastor I'm lame in both feet listen when you sit up against the table nobody gets to see your feet anyways that's what I love about this table, this banqueting table that we'll all be able to eat at. No one can see our mess. I know that's why some of you don't want to get your feet washed. I know. Self-conscious. But in the kingdom of God, we don't have to be self-conscious. We're not there because we earned it. We're there not for Jonathan's sake. We're there for Jesus' sake. He paid the way. No, you didn't earn it, and you never will. But love isn't earned. And God loves you, and he wants to restore you. He wants you to come to this table. There are people here today that are still hurting from the past couple of years in this church. I didn't live through it. I just heard about it. And I don't care who's responsible, whose fault it is, if, if, it, was, if it was self-inflicted. It, it, at this point, it doesn't matter, Saul. You're still invited to the table. But I betrayed somebody or someone betrayed me, yes, and they'll still get to eat at the table. And their feet will be washed. Don't be afraid. Don't consult someone else. Which words are you going to listen to? I'm going to listen to God's word. What does Jesus say about me? His words count. Father, thank you so much for this challenge. We're going to take part in this beautiful communion service, and we're going to do so at the table. We're going to eat the rest of our meals at your table, the rest of our meals at your table. We will be treated like sons and daughters of the king because you declared it. Your words count count your words are whom we trust and we will follow so prepare our hearts for what we're about to experience as we come to the table of grace in Jesus name